<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome to this lunchtime session for design.convenience, part of the Helen Hammond Center's uh, design.different series. Um, I'm Joanne Bichard. I'm Professor of Accessible Design here at the RCA HHCD. And we've three excellent speakers today who will be talking, us, talking to us about their work, each of which will explore how cities are often inconvenient for the citizens they were designed for. One of the key issues this raises is does a city in which design does not consider inclusive convenience make it also unsustainable? So this webinar will be an hour long and it will be recorded so you can tell all your friends about it if, and for those who might have missed it. We would like to invite you to ask questions through the chat function and we will be answering them after everyone's presented. So to kick off today, we have Anika Lundqvist. Anika is the founder of Pedestrian Space, a Warsaw-based media advocacy, advocacy and engagement project that focuses on all, aspect, all aspects of the pedestrian experience. Our next presenter is Dr. Katie Gaudian, our Senior Research Associate at the HHCD. Katie's just started a new project called Streets for Diversity. And although still in its early days, the work's inclusive interactions with neurodivergent pedestrians have highlighted some key issues. And finally, HHCD Senior Research Associate Gail Ramster will present our work on Engaged, a partnership with PIM Architecture Studio and funded by the London Mayor that work directly with communities and local authorities in London to explore new models of public provision. And so now I will hand you over to Anika. Thank you very much for such a warm welcome, Professor Bichard, and for um, yeah, including me in this webinar. So I shall share my screen. Please just let me know how it looks before, wait one second, sorry. There we go. Okay, everything looks good. Here we are. So the title of what I will be sharing today is Walkability, a Foundational Dimension for Sustainable Urbanism. I won't read all this, but a little bit about me. I am currently a PhD student at the Institute of Geography and Spatial Organization here in Warsaw, Poland with the Polish Academy of Sciences, as well as a fellow at the Schumacher Institute co-founder of a recent initiative, Urban Transit Lab, and founder of pedestrianspace.org, which is a platform devoted to issues of walkability as key for sustainable urbanism. So just a quick snapshot of the work I'm doing. I'm looking at Warsaw as a laboratory for walkability, utilizing a qualitative and transdisciplinary approach and really approaching this topic of um, sustainable mobility with a real deep focus on walkability as a quality of life uh, indicator. So as um, many of us who are working with issues in mobility know, walkability has uh, these basic building blocks. First of all, the existence of sidewalks. Um, uh, if you're familiar with uh, walkability advocacy, you're aware perhaps that in cities across the world, we have often uh, fragmented um, networks and, and uh really difficult issues around um, infrastructure. So also issues of accessibility, thermal comfort here in Europe, we're entering summer. So this, this issue really crops up um, also around the world with uh, increasing heat. Um, so thermal comfort for pedestrian mobility, also of course, issues of safety and also quality efficient public transit. Um, for a walkable city, we need to always consider um, the uh, efficacy of public transit. Not everybody wants to walk, you know, across districts. Certainly Warsaw here, we have 18 districts. Um, it's not feasible to consider that everybody's moving by foot for all of their daily needs. So an efficient public transit system is really critical. Um, I've been very busy here in Warsaw doing workshops. My workshops look at uh, mo mobility behavior through the lens of choice. 
So all of you present, what cho what uh, choices do you have available outside your door in your neighborhood to move around? And then the decisions people make from that and then how that shapes their mobility behavior through the week. Uh, this is from a recent workshop here in Warsaw. Um, I, I employ what I call this urban clinic approach to engaging with citizens. Um, I consider it a flexile, flexible, mobile, and contem contemporary approach in which I host these workshops across the city. And the urban clinic approach is also um, used because I'm also offering space for people to unpack trauma associated with mobility. Um, um, people often have these stories, they're coming to these workshops with stories of fear around a particular mode or stigma, whether warranted or not around a particular mode. So we're unpacking, we're, we're, we're diving deep at these sessions and it's exciting because it's not just one-on-one -on -one with me, but, but you can see inhabitants, they're also sharing stories and, um, exploring uh, both, be both best practices and barriers that they're experiencing with walkability. And as I like to say, I inhabit my research. I am a passionate walker and I also love a great public transit system. So um, I'm in the laboratory every day. And also importantly, on a philosophical note, for me in my personal life, I consider it a liberty. I consider the freedom to move by foot um, as my primary mode uh, in a city, I consider this to be um, an aspect of liberty, of, of living and not having to be car dependent, not, not being forced to, to need a car to move around. And of course, this uh, touches on issues of spatial equity. So who has access to the city and who struggles? Uh, this is um, uh, a, a stairway I have to often navigate uh, here in Warsaw. Warsaw has a lot of best practices, but also some of these barriers. And you can see me from time to time scaling these stairs with my five-year-old daughter carrying my stroller. And so uh, coming to this session and how I also became connected with Professor Bichard and her great work around uh, public toilet access and design, toilet equity is a pretty new frontier in my work. Um, so I had this originally as a video, it didn't, didn't embed in the PDF, but this is a video I took of a public bathroom here in Poland in Krakow. Um, I currently live in Poland, we've been here for almost two years, and it was around this time I took this video, this is a still from that video uh, last summer, and it was around this time that I realized that I had years of negative experiences dealing with um, public bathrooms, either experiencing a complete lack of public toilets in the cities I've lived in. I've lived in many cities um, in Europe and North America or experiencing existing public toilets, but in such horrific condition that you don't want to use them and that you're kind of traumatized to use them again, uh, having to go into commercial entities and grovel to, you know, use the bathroom or buy something. Um, so I also recognized how that, uh, how that lack affected my own behavior. For example, when I take my daughter to the playground, maybe I don't have a cup of coffee in the morning or even bring a bottle of water because I'm aware that playground doesn't have a toilet. How does this then affect people's, um, um, you know, hydration in the summer or parents, uh, parents' quality of life or in general, as we know, obviously this is a quality of life issue for all people. Uh, but so this started off as a personal experience. So I began to really pay attention. This particular bathroom here was too zwati to use. I forget what the conversion was. It might be around 50 euro cents. So an example of a paid bathroom. But here and here is a person, a full a, a person who is there staff full time, um, cleaning the bathroom, making sure the bins are emptied, making sure things are tidy. So I thought, hmm, this is interesting. So I began to pay attention to what's going on with toilets here. And these examples, I really need to emphasize <laughs> the situation across cities is, is not um, great. I would say there's really a lack, uh, but there are also, I believe, these best practices um, that I'm looking to identify in my work. And so here is a public toilet, definitely an accessibility issue, but I do wanna share this because this was a real turning point last summer. This is a small town in Southern Poland called Skavina. And I was here in the town square with my daughter. She had to go to the bathroom. And so I asked a cafe, do you have a bathroom? No, there's one over there underground. And I thought, oh my gosh, 
I was thinking every which way, how can we avoid using that bathroom? Um, but there was no other option. So we go down and, and clearly this is a significant access issue. Obviously anybody who's mobility impaired and cannot use stairs, this is a problem. Um, so I am curious where the wheelchair accessible bathrooms are nearby because this town is well known for special needs services and um, a lot of mobility impaired um, services. But this happened to be the bathroom we used on this day. And I get down there and lo and behold, <laughs> paintings on the wall. Off to the right here is a, um, I guess you can call it a toilet office. There's a person permanently staffed. So two sides, this was the um, woman's side. These are free bathrooms. Um, so really beginning to also document, um, much probably to the person working there's curiosity, beginning to document uh, these, situa these situations of free, uh, public, clean, well-maintained bathrooms and how, um, how they're doing this, uh, which I will be investigating uh, as bringing this as a layer into my dissertation, in fact, as one of the case studies uh, for a layer of walkability in the city. And also at Pedestrian Space, I began to document, if there's a moment to share the video afterwards, I can do this after I close this PDF, beginning to document and share across my channels and finding out um, you know, helping to jump, jumping in the public dialogue about toilet toilet equity, but also looking to help create further dialogue because I believe this is extraordinarily neglected topic. Again, what led me to reaching out to Professor Bichard and realizing how severe the problem is across Europe. Here we are in Europe, but also worldwide. And you know, I would post videos I've taken. I'm always exploring anytime I pass by a public bathroom. Now I'm documenting it. Always making sure there's no people in the frame. And here you can just see some comments people are writing, um, really detailing the lack that they experience in their cities and sort of just this collective, you know, gasp that how, how is it possible that we're at the state in 2023 uh, talking about sustainable urbanism, but many people barely have access to a public, a clean public bathroom, a clean and safe public bathroom. So what I'm doing in my work now in Warsaw looking ahead to is bringing in this layer, looking to get the story of this particular um, network. Every single Metro stop in Warsaw has such a bathroom and is staffed throughout open hours. Uh, so I consider this a international best practice. Um, this is a still from a video, but so just going in here, nothing special, just simply a clean, continuously well-maintained um, public toilet and a topic for another day. Here's another aspect of my work that I'm uh, using as a case study in my dissertation, the thermal comfort at public transit stops. This is in Warsaw, literally on the same block. As we know, urban heat is a serious um, public health issue as well. So this is, uh, I have five case studies in my dissertation for walkability. Three are place-based and two are amenities, one which is toilet equity and one which is uh, thermal comfort at public transit stops. So please feel free to note down my contact information if you would like to get in touch. Pedestrian Space is my main platform. I also founded and facilitate the Global Walkability Correspondence Network. Uh, I founded that in January 2022. We are now at over 200 members from all across the world who we connect on issues of walkability, exchange knowledge, provide solidarity, create media about the state of pedestrian mobility in our communities, and then Urban Transit Lab, which we just recently kicked off as a participatory media research and communication um, initiative to help accelerate the sustainable mobility shift, mainly with stories from inhabitants. So we are developing cohorts in cities, and we have our first two partnerships launching this year. I don't know if there's time to share a, it's an under minute video. What do you think, Professor Bishard? Oh, Joanne, please. Um, right, Joanne. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we 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 can share it under a minute. That would be great if we can get it working. Okay, so let me just pull it up here. I'm sure Katie and Gail don't mind a little delay. Thank you, Katie Gail. Thank you very much. I just think it's nice to be able to. Here we are. Is that centered? I'll just take you.
Yeah, that was definitely under a minute. And there's, I have one more for you because I think the visuals are just so important to be able to come in here. And you will also see the access notes for the Metro station. That's great, Anika. Thank you. Thank you. Those are really yes. interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a videographer, but I think the video is important to, to bring you to it. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Well, I know I've got a whole bunch of questions I want to ask you, but we'll be saving those to the end and bring your, you know, if you have questions for Anika specifically about, you know, toilets in Europe and pedestrian access and everything, um, please start entering them into the chat. I'm now going to hand over to Katie. Um, Katie, uh, you're up next. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Anika. That was really interesting. And I can definitely relate to the not drinking water before a playground visit. Um, I'll just screen my share my slides. Um, here we go. Can everyone see that? Oh, can everyone see that? No. Oh, sorry. I'll try again. Is that good? Great. Okay, well, hi everyone. My name is Katie Jodion. Um, I'm a senior research associate here at the Helen Hammond Center for Design. Um, I'm neurodivergent and over the past 16 years, I've been really fortunate to work and collaborate with neurodivergent people, in particular people across the autistic spectrum um, and exploring ways to make their everyday um, lives comfortable and enjoyable. I've worked within a range of contexts from supported living accommodation, mental health hospitals, garden design, healthcare services, and more recently, as Joanne explained, street design. What I, I should have uh, skipped the slide then, sorry. <laughs> What I mean by um, neurodivergence is um, it refers to people who are not neurotypical, so including but not restricted to autism, Tourette's, dyslexia, dyspraxia. Historically, um, particularly in the field of universal design, there's been a particular focus on improving a person's physical access needs. But since the turn of the century, the Helen Hammond Center for Design has increasingly sought to expand its focus to purposely include design projects that involve neurodivergent people whose needs and challenges may not be so visible or as obvious as others. In 2016, we were really fortunate to collaborate with the British Standards Institution to gather insights to support the development of new design guidelines for the built environment that considers the needs of neurodivergent people. And what's fantastic is um, a new design for mind paths, which means publicly available specification was launched and is now available, which is great. Um, but whilst the PAS has a small section on streets, and outdoor spaces, there still is very little knowledge um, on how neurodivergent people experience streets in the public realm, um, which has so many unpredictable variables. So, and anecdotally, I've met um, lots of people whose sensory perceptual experience of the environment can really affect their experience of the outdoors. Um, so for example, um, being anxious whilst walking along pavements in case of a dog passing, um, perceiving shadows as holes or squalid blocks, not wanting to actually walk across the path because of that. And um, I've met a lady who's very hypersensitive to the sound of car engines running. So she'll make sure her, or her support worker will make sure that she doesn't go out at the time of schools closing, for example, where there's lots of traffic. Um, thanks to the Reef Jeffries Road Fund, I'm really pleased to briefly share with you a project called Streets for Diversity, which I'm currently working on with colleagues um, Steph Powell and um, Dan Phillips from the Intelligent Mobility Design Centre here at the Royal College of Arts. The project aims to bridge the gap in research and I hypothesise that our own, our current streets and public realm may by design exclude those of us that are neurodivergent. 
Um, to investigate this, we've invited neuro neurodivergent citizens and transport experts to participate in a range of co-design activities that include walk and talks, online surveys, interviews, co-creation workshops, which together explore the challenges and opportunities found on our urban streets. Um, we're in the middle, we're right in the middle of the project, so there's not much to show you just yet, but what I can share with you is a selection of insights we have gathered so far, which I think um, gives us a little insight into how convenient our streets or cities can or can't be for neurodivergent people or those that might experience sensory sensitivities. Um, so I'll just run, run through some of those with you now. I find construction work and crowds of people overwhelming, especially if the construction work is forcing me to walk a different route or has in any way changed my usual way of getting somewhere. If there are overcrowded streets, I can experience very physical symptoms of anxiety, which include chest tightness, tense shoulders and shortness of breath, which can be difficult to manage in busy areas. When I cannot get my personal space, it gets too much to have people all around you. I also find it overwhelming to constantly have to pay attention to where others are when walking on the street, navigating around them. Because I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community, I've had unpleasant encounters in and around Pride Month relating to harassment. High streets, especially at big stores, always too many influences and things to catch your attention. This is pure overload and stress. Glare from the sun sky can make seeing quite difficult. So I've started to wear sunglasses on bright days to make myself more secure. Streets and roads can be scary because of sudden traffic noise and difficulties judging safe distances when it's okay to cross where no lights. I find streets with a lot of different stores next to each other, a lot of challenges in music styles, sound volumes and smells, all very challenging. Busy roads are what I find most overwhelming, and there are many in my area. When they are less busy, it's a nice walk with lots of greenery. However, when there's constant traffic, I need my headphones to zone it out. A lot of people are concentrated on when you get there, what are the barriers when you get there, but the biggest and the first barrier is getting there. One of the biggest challenges that autistic adults face when going out into the community and into public spaces is actually the fear and the anticipation before they get out. You don't know where the roadworks are. You might not know if there's a space to sit down and take a break. There might not be, um, there might not be somewhere. If somebody's anxiety is escalating, then people need to just, just somewhere to go that's quiet where they can take time out. So it's about knowing um, where those spaces are. Walking is really important for my mental health. I walk at least one day, either by myself, with my dog or my friends. My favorite walks are along a low, a low or no traffic path overlooked by trees and nature. I've got an itis in a couple of weeks. I'll leave a little bit early so I can sit in the park for 10 minutes and breathe the fresh air and listen to the birds because it kind of gives you just that little bit of space in your head. A quiet, non-overstimulating, successful journey can make me feel really accomplished and positive about myself. Okay, I wanted um, to wrap up this presentation with public conveniences which are an important feature of the street. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with hand dryers. Um, a really interesting story is um, I once met a mother whose autistic son really dislikes the sound of hand dryers. So to avoid the hand dryer, she would do one of two things. Um, either they'd go into the disabled toilet and where she would say sometimes they get funny looks because they don't look disabled or they go into regular toilet and um, she's actually created her own out of order sign, which she places on the hand dryer to prevent any other hand dryers for going off whilst her son's um, using the toilet, which I think is such an interesting, clever idea. Um, 
I think how convenient a city is can vary and widely depends on individual needs and preferences. The hand drive, for example, is convenient for many people. It's quick, hygienic, but not for others like the autistic boy who's highly sensitive to sound. I think how we negotiate everyone's needs and preferences uh, to make a city convenient for all is a really interesting design challenge. Um, if you do have any thoughts or ideas, um, please get in touch. And if you identify as neurodivergent or experience sensory sensitivities, it'd be fantastic to share with us your experience of the streets. And um, hopefully Michaela will send you a link to our on online survey through chat. So um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Katie. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that the, I think this area is going to throw up a, a whole no, new load of challenges for inclusion of the built environment and thinking about how we're going to design, you know, more inclusively um, and thinking about, you know, the, the issues of neurodivergence. It's, you know, personally, I find it very fascinating that we've spent a lot of time designing for sensory disabilities but not for over sensory um, conditions. So that really throws another sort of interesting challenge for our fabulous designers. So thank you. Right, moving on. Gail, hello. Hey. Um, Gail um, is uh, the senior research associate that I mentioned uh, earlier on. Sorry, I've lost my place in my script. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I have lost my place in my script. Where are you? Where am I? Right on. Da, 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 da. Yes, sorry. Gail is our final speaker of the session. Sorry, Gail. And uh, she co-leads the RCA's Public Toilet Research Unit. And this is the only one of its kind in the UK. And um, she's going to be presenting about her recent work with Engaged. Thanks, Gail. <coughs> Thanks, Joanne. Uh, my Zoom is not allowing me to share, which is a problem. Uh, just need a minute. I guess I've not used it on this computer before. Thanks everyone for your patience with our little technical. Yeah, that's a bit unhelpful. <laughs> so yes. Just song. Can't, can't. Oh. Can I uh, send it to you? Send, send it to me? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Can Gail send it to me? Yes, of course you can, Gail. <laughs> um, wow, I wonder why that happened. Yeah, I've never heard that before. It wants me to change my security settings. Which, uh, That's not really the time. Oh, okay. Right. Is it going to be on? Are you are you sending it link to Google? Um, that's a good idea. I know. I can't believe I suggested it. <laughs> Gail and I are always working across different platforms. I know it drives her nuts sometimes. Google, Google, right. Sing. Yeah, I'm spinning. I don't have it yet. La la la. Thanks for your patience, everyone, with our little. We all, we all tried, we all tested everything initially and it was all working. So, but these things do happen. Mm. 
Michaela says, do you want to send it to Michaela? Yeah, I'm going to mail it to Michaela. Okay. Michaela's got it. She hasn't, hasn't sent it yet. Oh. oh, you have to know she hasn't got it. Sorry. <laughs> right, send. Um, yes. Fly. Right, I've sent that and we'll have a look at this. So I hope everybody's thinking of ooh, ooh. fabulous questions for us to, uh, you know, um, for afterwards, but we will have a discussion after Gail's presentation between um, ourselves um, and and then we will open it up to questions. So please, please send us questions. If we run over, well, we won't run over because we have strict, we, we keep to strict timings here. Um, but if we don't manage to answer your question, we will get back to you personally. So yeah, okay. Not yet. No, nope, still not yet. Okay. Send. I can now. Um... Oh, hang on. Maybe it's now going to. <gasps> oh, <gasps> girls! Yay! Thank you. Girls, yeah. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. Okay, over to you, Gail. Hello. <laughs> I'm uh, Gail Munster, and I'm a senior research associate at uh, the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design. Um, and my research uses the people-centered and co-design methods that we use here um, to explore how design can address all sorts of different social challenges uh, with the intention of improving people's lives. So through this, I've worked on lots of different topics uh, that are connected to the design of our future cities. So such as uh, the future of autonomous vehicles, um, place-based interventions for childhood obesity, um, workplace design and the future of healthcare. But the area I started and keep coming back to, um, which is becoming a bit of a theme of the session, is public toilets. So um, as Joanne mentioned, I co-lead the public toilets research unit with her um, and we produced the Great British public toilet map, um, which is shown at the top, and also produce inclusive design guidance about public toilets. Um, we also have a website called Tinkle, the Toilets Innovation and New Knowledge Exchange, where you can find all of these resources that we produce, but also lots of resources that other people produce across the UK about public toilet design. So today- Gail, Sorry, Gail, to interrupt. I don't think your slides are moving on. Ooh, my screen sharing is closed. Do, 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 do. Better? <laughs> so today I'll be talking about toilets as part of our city's infrastructure and, and the way in which they help people to move around, um, as well as our project Engage that looked at reusing empty uh, vacant units as public toilets. Um, toilets are really mentioned in city guidance and in urban design guidance, um, and yet there are so many contexts in which they are critical, um, some of which like Katie and Annika mentioned today. So. For example, the, the challenge of playgrounds, of, of nature, accessing green space and spending time in, in our parks and our playgrounds needs toilets. Also very relevant for public transport, as has been mentioned, uh, to visit the high street, um, for tourism in the city. And then lots of people will need toilets to commute, um, well, not just commuting, but many people work outdoors. So, for example, delivery drivers, taxi drivers, people who spend all day outdoors have public toilets as their, their office toilets, as it would. Um, also, an interesting case of commuting is then shift workers, where so many fewer toilets are available during the night time. Active travel, including walking as well as cycling, this is being heavily promoted in, at the moment as a sustainable way of moving around our cities. This too requires toilets. And then there's the, the, the um, to remember that toilets need to be available at all times of day, so for the nighttime economy as well. But what is an inclusive public toilet? So I've got two really good examples from London of, of what that might look like. So for example, this is the Welcome Collection, um, a museum gallery near Euston in, North in well, the centre of London, where there's lots of really great inclusive design going on here. So for example, the standard cubicles, many of them have grab rails. There's really high colour contrast for people with visual impairments. Um, there's 
really big uh, locks and flushes and sensor taps for people that may have limited dexterity uh, for, due to arthritis or, or for children, for example. Um, there's also, they've used the same strong design aesthetic across their standard gender neutral facility and their uh, disabled access, the accessible toilet and their changing places toilet, which is a toilet designed for people with profound multiple, multiple disabilities. Temporary freezing, it seems. Pardon? Anything right? Not freezing? Good. Um, <laughs> And then they've also had a very inclusive approach to their public toilets. So it's not just for people that visit the welcome collection. They've designed it so that it is publicly accessible to anybody walking in that area, including people that might be living outdoors um, and the, you know, other people that need toilets as part of the city's infrastructure. So that's a really nice um, approach to have. Secondly, Network Rail. So Network Rail managed 20 train stations across the country, mostly in London, and they used to charge 50p to use their toilets. Um, and from Victoria train station alone, one year they made one million pounds from these 50p charges. And yet about five years ago, they had a change in policy. So they decided to scrap all charges um, to all of their stations toilets. And this was because of a desire to put passengers first, be more um, inclusive and to consider the passenger experience. So they not only improved their toilets, but they added benches to their stations too. And they spent eight million pounds just redoing Victoria's train stations toilets, which now look like this. Um, they've now done, I think, refurbished all of their train stations toilets and produced a design manual for how to design really good toilets and stations. So this is really nice to see because there's very little kind of urban design guidance. We even mention the toilets in urban design guidance. So for them to do this just for public toilets is amazing. Um, but there's also still pretty poor examples of public toilets in the city. So whether that's UV lighting, um, charging for access and then the barriers and turnstiles that go with that, or just a really poorly situated toilet that's not a very pleasant environment. And this assumes that toilets are available at all. So in a lot of cases, there aren't any public toilets. Between 2000 and 2020, um, a third of public toilets in England and Wales have closed. So this is data from the Valuations Office Agency, which is quoted in Parliament. And the example on the right is a really interesting case where a public toilet was closed over 10 years ago. Local residents then campaigned to save it and turned it into a community cafe for most of the building with um, the ladies turned into a gender neutral toilet for public access. This then became a commercial premise as it became a, a restaurant and bar still with access to, public, to the public toilet. But then by 2021, that had closed down too. So now it wasn't just a closed public toilet, but um, a closed commercial premise as well, which is becoming a sort of familiar sight on our high street um, in this post-pandemic era. But these council toilets don't show the whole picture. So of the nearly 4,000 council toilets that do still exist in um, England and Wales, that's just a small number of the toilets that are available. So as I showed you earlier with the Welcome Collection and Network Rail, there's also private providers that have Ex toilets that are accessible to the public. Um, so this is the, the yellow stream at the bottom, um, as well as transport stations. There's also shopping centers and larger department stores where they're privately provided, but this is a publicly accessible toilet. And then within the public realm um, too, we also have toilets in the libraries and the town hall. So public buildings with toilets that can add to our city's infrastructure. So this is why Joanne and I made the Great British Public Toilet Map in order to show, well, we have 14,000 toilets across the country when we take this sort of larger picture pulled from thousands of different providers and all mapped um, on one website. And just to show what that looks like for a part of central London, actually where the Welcome Collection is. So this is Regent's Park, um, Euston Station, King's Cross and St Pancras stations. And there are 26 toilets marked with the grey pins in the picture. But of these, only seven are actually public toilets. And even then that's three different providers, two councils and the Royal Parks. But then there are one, two, three, four, five, six toilets in train stations and tube stations. Um, three in Camden Council's community toilet scheme where they're actually paying local businesses to allow anybody to use the toilets in those shops. Uh, four in other public buildings. So this is Camden's libraries and their town hall. Five in cultural institutions, different museums and galleries that have free access and one in a hospital. So while there were only seven public toilets, there are actually 26 publicly accessible toilets. And this has really helped us to find the real gaps in toilet provision. 
So last year we started looking at London specifically and with help from the Greater London Authority, they ran a, a um, survey through their platform Talk London where we had 2000 responses from Londoners to ask them about high streets in particular and whether there were toilets on their high streets. So 59% of these respondents said that they do not have public toilets in their town centre or high street. And of those 59%, 59% again, said that that would limit the amount of time that they would spend in an area <clears throat> due to this lack of public toilets. So this is really good evidence to show how important it is to the high street and to people's quality of life and uh, ability to like participate and go out um, that high streets have toilets. And we then used that great British public toilet map data as well and mapped it against Greater London Authority data on where high streets and town centres were in order to find the, the toilet deserts, um, phrase HUK London um, used recently to show those high streets that don't have um, toilets. We've used this evidence to then launch our engaged projects. So engaged was funded by the Mayor of London um, and in as part of a programme to look at innovative ideas that responded to uh, a post-pandemic recovery for London. So Engaged was in partnership with PIM Studio Architects, a London-based architects, and the idea was to look at empty shops and see whether they could be reused as part public toilet, part business. This was to sort of respond to, or find an alternative model for public toilets, because a public toilet building is very expensive for councils um, and often prone to like vandalism and misuse, but the community toilet schemes where councils were paying existing shops and restaurants to allow anybody to use their toilets. They don't work if there's a large number of people, a large footfall, um, and also the counts have no control over the design of that facility. So it's um, hard to make it inclusive and hard to fill a gap, a design gap in, compared to what's already been provided locally. So there were three elements to engaged that we wanted to explore. The idea that it would have a business attached to it. So by having part of the unit still used as um, a pop-up business or an incubator, then that presence could really be like a guardian for the toilet and help to mitigate against some of that um, antisocial behaviour that might happen if it was just a toilet on its own. It would be designed to be inclusive, so by looking at an empty unit, the toilet could be designed from scratch so that it really was fulfilling as many needs as possible and really responding to the local needs as well. So it was designed to fill, fulfil a need that was um, not being fulfilled. Um, in, in the local area. So if it was like a, a changing tables weren't available or, or a gender neutral facility was needed or a changing places toilet, then it could be designed to meet the need. And then a public health angle. So post COVID, um, there's, there's a need for far more hand washing on our streets. There's also been um, a campaign by the mayor to have more drinking water and drinking fountains. And then out of hours, that space at the front of the shop could also be used for different public health needs, whether it's like a vaccination clinic, um, or a welfare stop for, for at night time if people are drunk on the street and need somewhere to calm down. So we looked at engaged at three different levels. So we looked nationally to see how it would fit into the current infrastructure by interviewing experts in retail, community safety, government and urban design. We looked across London regionally to and worked with councils and regeneration to see really understand how it could be implemented if it could be implemented through, through regeneration. And then we looked at a very hyper local level at one neighbourhood in particular, it was uh, Hackney Central in East London, to work with local people there and understand what needs were being fulfilled and what was still lacking. And we did this through on street engagement in uh, markets and co design workshops with specific groups. So I'm going to talk a bit about the workshop with regeneration officers. So this was run uh, by Rosanna Trainer. Uh, about a year ago and we had 13 participants from across seven London boroughs and we ran a series of activities to understand um, each one came with a very specific regeneration project so we understood what the the opportunities were for engage within these projects any barriers that existed to an idea like this and how a version of engage might best fit within their boroughs needs and characteristics so Thinking about the barriers first, um, there was a problem that maybe they didn't have enough empty shops or didn't know how to kind of negotiate with the landlords to make it work. But one big challenge um, was also how many how many council departments we would need to work with in order to make this happen and that kind of internal bureaucracy. So one regeneration officer said that regeneration could come up with the money and the ideas, and this often includes better toilets, but these can easily be lost once the scheme moves to other departments such as urban planning and through its implementation. Then there's lots of competing needs um, 
the needs of the developer um, that, that start to interact and that, uh, that passion for the community for better toilets can get lost. But in terms of opportunities for engage, this community angle can also be a benefit. So regeneration needs to engage with the local community and toilets are something that they get passionate about. And also the idea that regeneration generates money. Um, they said that public toilets, even existing ones, even if poorly used, it's very hard to get funding to improve something that's already there. But it is easy to get funding for new innovative things. And that could then happen to have toilets as part of that offering. So regeneration of and new developments can be a good way to get a better toilet um, in place. We also talked, thinking more specifically about their individual uh, regeneration projects, we talked about alternatives to the empty shops model. So the idea that an existing public toilet block could be extended or reconfigured, reconfigured to include that business element. And then we looked at temporary use of space too. So lots of regeneration um, areas have sites earmarked for future development, but that development may not happen for five or 10 years. In the meantime, these box parks using container um, boxes um, are appearing, which, um, you know, they're quite semi-permanent because they'll be there for five, 10 years, but they can have cafes and restaurants, shops, um, and be a, a really nice public space and a good use of that. Um, unused land. So our partners, PIM Studio Architects, drew up different designs for how these container, ship, container, ships, container boxes could be used. Um, one as the public toilets, see how many could be fitted, and then the other one as the business with a, with a communal space, a public space in between. For example, here one is being used as, a, uh, as the toilets, and then the other one is a toy library with the toys overspilling for playgroups um, into the public space in between with play equipment. Um, and it creates a really nice space for the community within the city. Other configurations have them um, facing each other or on different levels. With one of the units used as a cafe or restaurant, a um, co-working space, or even a delivery hub for delivery drivers, as that's one area that the city in London is really interested in at the moment. How can delivery drivers, you know, Deliveroo and Uber Eats, have a, wel a welfare space, um, a base for themselves, which has toilets and has space to rest and space that's warm in the evening um, to really kind of facilitate that nighttime economy. So all of these reports and uh, findings are available on our website at the Royal College of Art. And you can also just contact me if you'd like to hear any more about the project. Otherwise, I'll hand you over back to Joanne. Thank you, Gail. And thank you to uh, Anika, Katie, and Gail for uh, sharing your work with us today. Um, I, as always, have a bunch of questions um, and I'm going to start in the with the order of presentations. And I'd like to ask you, Anika, um, it was really interesting seeing and hearing about the toilet situation in Warsaw, some of the good examples and some of the bad examples, especially of access and hence convenience. But, um, one of the things I was wondering was, are there areas of, of the city that are more accessible than other areas? Are there areas that are kind of getting it right? You mentioned there was like 18 different um, principalities, municipalities sort of thing, principalities, where am I? Um, so I was wondering if there's some areas that would be more accessible than other areas. It's a very long question. This is uh, what I want to do with my case study approach, and um, I would say locals are sometimes aghast when I when I light up talking about the public toilet situation because I think provision across the 18 districts. Some people actually say they should be called boroughs because each district has its own um, administration is not great. There is a lot to improve upon. Uh, so I haven't included the examples I'm seeing that I haven't included uh, the what I would call not great examples. There's a lot of, what do we call them, automated, new automated uh, toilets. And my personal experience thus far, and I'm always running around parks and documenting toilets, is they're often out of order or closed. Whereas, again, within the metro system, I, I am asserting this as what I consider an international best practice, because they are, all of them, completely staffed um, during all the open hours that I really appreciated in uh, 
your presentation, Gail, the reference to the nighttime economy, because I, 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 this is this is an issue because I think these metro toilets do close at some point. They're not open all night. Uh, but Warsaw is looking to expand its metro system. We have only two lines. So there are many districts that don't have a metro stop. So um, this is not um, a citywide best practice, uh, but I'm identifying it as a you know, a best practice within a public transit system and Warsaw is looking to grow to five five uh, lines in the coming years, massive project. And I want to do some interviews and get into the story of um, how they're being managed because it's not, I don't believe it's the transit authority that's paying for the staffing, it's an external company. But to me, this staffing is the key, this human element of permanent staffing. It's the key to an element of safety. It's a key to me to the reality that I rarely ever go into a bathroom and see a bin overflowing or feel that it's so it's such a state that I can't even use it. They're all relatively always being tidied up, always being maintained. So to me, this is really excellent um, considering the case we have in cities across the world of, yeah, just the, such a poor public state of um, of toilets. And mm -hmm. uh, and so many people through, through my now media side of sharing this, uh, really hearing from people about the traumas they have, really, mm -hmm. really, uh, deep traumas with public toilet experiences. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Anika. Um, I just want to follow on to with that with Katie. I know you're in the really early stages, Katie, of your research. But has there been one aspect of of inconvenience that might be beginning to emerge for neurodivergent pedestrians and people who access the street? Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't got any answers just yet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I think a really interesting thing that's coming through the research so far is, um, I touched on it during my presentation, is that that feeling before you actually start a journey. So there's lots of focus on the journey and how to make that more comfortable. But actually, for a lot of people, it's actually before they even open their door to go outside, that anticipation, the unknown, um, the what ifs. And um, I know um, when I worked in supported living accommodations, a lot of time and effort went in by support workers who are working with people that may have high support needs, really planning carefully their journey to the point where they may actually avoid a green space because they know that that person doesn't like dogs and there could be an, a potential you know, there could be people walking their dogs in that green space. So um, I think there's something about, yeah, sort of um, how do you monitor or or manage or sort of live um, uh, things going on in the street, which because I think mean, that's what's so challenging, interesting about the street. It's so unpredictable, uncontrollable, um, so many variables, which you don't necessarily get so much in, in the built environment. You know, if you're too hot, you can turn up the heating or you can move away from people um so yeah that's my thinking so far but it yeah like I well, say there's there's still lots more to think and process and explore yeah yeah and Gail um you know where do you think Engage is going to go next <laughs> um there's lots of of uh ways it could go um I think one thing that I've been thinking whilst listening to Katie and Annika is that the idea of um, one of our researchers Madeline called it utopia the idea that toilets could be kind of the heart of the high street and hearing Katie you talk about um some of the participants in your project needing to know that there was a place to rest and sit and pause and get away from all the kind of overstimulation of the city um and all me or even getting somewhere early so that they could sit in the park for a little while and then Annika when you're talking about that thermal control from the tree cover like whether it's from the traffic or the weather or just the, the stress of moving around the city like designing in those places to be calm and peaceful outdoors in the city I think is really important and something that we always feel kind of hurried on and not allowed to to just sit um the toilets were a tiny part of that because I used to use them as a way to just step away and not be in the middle of all the hustle and bustle of London and just you know whether you really need the toilet or not just it could be a lot calmer particularly without the hand dryers being there and a lot cooler and just and, and it's really the only private space that there is in the city and it's quasi private space but the only time that you get to be away from security cameras and everything else and people 
um, in a weird way in the toilet cubicle, but designing in more opportunities for that semi-privacy or at least um, quietness, relaxation, I think is, is a good angle to look at. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. We've had some questions come in. Um, uh, one, um, Anika, um, there's one for you from Anthony Shepherd. And he asks, uh, thank you so much for such interesting presentations. Um, could Anika maybe speak about best practice examples in Poland and specifically what have been the drivers for this in Warsaw, um, you know, maybe compared to the UK? Um, has it been part of a specific drive or more developed through chance? So, Joanne, I'm hoping I can perhaps rejoin you in some months for a webinar and share share some findings because I don't have the answer. I do know uh, this. there is a history of um, staffed toilets here in Poland, I believe. Uh, there's, there's a history and I, it might connect to communist times. This is something I have to figure out through interviews and studies. And from what I understand, the provision was not always great. There might have been a staff person there, but it didn't mean at all that things were good. Um, but today there's certainly a standard that has been set. And so this is precisely what I'll leave a comment here, precisely what I'm looking, one of the questions I'm looking to uh, figure out through that case study is, is how did this come to be and who's managing it and how are they seeing the cost and looking ahead, are they looking to preserve this system? Um, so yeah, I hope to, uh, I would love to join yeah. you again later this year. And I'm also very curious to hear about engaged developments at Engage. I love this model of uh, of um, the shared space. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of our research is always work in progress. So, um, you know, uh, you know, it's always a question of like, right, we don't, we haven't quite asked, we haven't quite got there yet with, with the analysis, but we'll, we'll get, we are getting there. Um, and this one's for Katie. Um, Katie, um, it was interesting to hear about the anxieties for public navigation, navigating space and including using public toilets. And I wondered if you had a plan to look at places such as Japan, who seem to have started to approach ways to resolve this and where they might be incorporated in. So basically, you're going to go international with your research. Um, thanks for the suggestion. I think, yeah, we definitely want to look at um good examples of what's what's going well not just in the UK and and you're right I think Japan's a really good place to look because just my own experience of going to Japan experience their toilets they're absolutely incredible um thinking about all the senses and um they they're always very quiet um super clean so um yeah that'll definitely be a, a space that we'll be looking into as part of the literature review as well so thank you fantastic so um oh we've got another Q&A one. Oh no, no, yes, no, no. Have we got another one, Michaela? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. I've got the little red box, but there's nothing there. Um, do you have any questions for each other in our last two minutes? I no. do, but I'm not sure if it would be like a one minute response, because I was just really interested to learn more about the urban clinic that you you do, Anika, and just what that looks and feels like. But I understand you don't have much time to um, respond. Yeah, and maybe that's good because I can go on. I can go on for a really long time. But basically, <laughs> it's taking this idea of the living living lab um, and looking at Warsaw as a living lab. I, I have my my undergraduate roots in psychology and my graduate roots in urban planning. So it's sort of tying in all these disciplines and approaching this urban lab concept, but with this clinic approach. And we're um, often my my uh, workshops are really attracting mobility minded inhabitants of the city, right? So these are just re regular residents. They're not studying mobility, but they're the, they're the residents that are often the type to test out the city, to be public transit enthusiasts, or to be testing routes with the with their bike, or you know testing walking routes. So it's a it's a really, um, I would say this kind of uh, yeah. I, I framed it as an urban clinic approach. There is some literature reference to, um, but but something to evolve um, also again, with unpacking trauma that people have with certain modes, because this is um, 
and stigma that is sometimes unfounded. So exploring mm. why some people think, oh, the bus is dirty. Well, you have your fellow inhabitants here who maybe who ride the bus daily who can share with you what it is, what it isn't, and sort of this space to unpack all these things. Um, so that's, again, would love to join you later in the year, next year, and share more. And uh, I'd, I'd like to take this to other places. So I'm really looking to refine my urban clinic methodology here. Excellent. Yes, we, we will definitely, we will definitely stay in touch, Anika. Right. Well, we're, we're two o'clock. I hope everybody had a nice lunch with us. We're going to go and get some lunch now. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, especially thank you to Anika, Katie and Gail for, you know, uh, taking part in this and sharing your our work, sharing their work with us. I also want to say a huge thanks to Michaela and Rosie, who have been sitting here at my side, reassuring me when things went a little bit funny. Um, and um, our next design a uh, different webinar will be, we don't know yet. <laughs> It'll be soon. So watch out on the Helen Hammond Centre's social media, which I'm sure we will be uh, promoting um, more about our Design Different series. Um, thank you again. And um, I'd just like to say to our UK audience, um, have a great bank holiday weekend and don't forget your sunblock. Apparently it's going to get hot. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thanks a lot. Take care now. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.